welcome to the uh, uh, live webinar. As uh, Ron mentioned, this is a, uh, a topic that is uh, developing in the echocardiographic literature uh, as uh, echo becomes more of a handheld or portable tool for us. Uh, a lot of uh, echo is being done uh, to monitor patients. And this uh, is an area that uh, really, uh, as we'll see going through the lecture, uh, requires a lot more um, involvement uh, from the whole echocardiographic community, uh, not just cardiologists or sonographers, but also our critical care specialists uh, and anesthesiologists that are now um, very uh, well trained in echocardiography, uh, uh, but who uh, really are using this in a manner that um, we haven't really uh, tested enough probably to know uh, how accurate or how helpful it is. Uh, it does require a, a considerable amount of expertise, as we'll talk about in a moment, to really use this as a quantitative monitoring tool. But the purpose of this webinar is to uh, discuss with you uh, the uh, areas where uh, ECHO has been used or has been uh, published uh, as a potential monitoring tool to uh, guide therapeutic interventions uh, and what uh, additional potential areas uh, would be uh, areas where this could be used. These are my disclosures. In addition to introducing the writing committee, uh, we'll discuss the objectives of the uh, webinar, uh, and then rapidly we'll go into the specific monitoring tools uh, that have been tested, uh, the clinical scenarios that have been tested, uh, including perioperative uh, monitoring, uh, and specifics on when a meaningful change has occurred in, in one of these uh, parameters we're using to guide uh, therapeutic interventions with some of the uh, uh, committee's recommendations on training requirements, uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions at the end, so let's get going here. This is the writing committee. Uh, Dr. Shilkut uh, and uh, Joan Olson um, are from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, uh, Dr. Glass uh, from Emory uh, in Atlanta. Uh, Mark Adams, uh, a, a sonographer and a fellow of the American Society of Echo at Mass General in Boston. Dr. Desjardins uh, at uh, Salt Lake City, uh, and Dr. Troughton, um, our international uh, member uh, from Christ Church in New Zealand. We also want to thank several of the writing committees uh, from the American Society of Echo and Anesthesiology that have helped uh, very much in formulating this document. You're all aware of Dr. Lang's uh, uh, impressive uh, presentation on the cardiac chamber quantification uh, we thank this uh, committee for helping us, uh, giving us some advance notice of the uh, normal values uh, and how that might be changing um, as part of this document. There still are some little subtle differences, and I'll point those out during the uh, webinar uh, uh, that uh, are, will guide us in some of the right ventricular measurements. And, of course, uh, Dr. Rudsky, who was chair of the right heart guidelines, Dr. Nagy headed the diastolic function guidelines, uh, Dr. Theis, uh, uh, who helped very much with the practice guidelines and chair was chair of the committee on the practice guidelines for perioperative uh, transesophageal echo uh, that was published in anesthesiology in 2010. Uh, the learning objectives today will be to, to define and give the potential advantages of echo as a uh, therapeutic monitoring tool in adults also then discuss and recognize uh, the echocardiographic parameters that should be used in various clinical scenarios uh, and apply echocardiographic-based hemodynamic measurements um, that can be used serially uh, to measure response to medical interventions and determine the sur surgical settings that may benefit from uh, quantitative transesophageal echo monitoring guidance. And then, as we said, we'll discuss the minimum level of training the committee thought that was necessary to use uh, ECHO as a monitoring tool. Our definition uh, in this setting is that ECHO, uh, when it's used as a monitoring, monitoring tool, is after that initial diagnostic assessment, that full uh, echocardiogram that patients get for uh, a wide variety of indications, uh, where ECHO then is used as a repetitive hemodynamic or anatomic assessment tool uh, where these measurements are being made over a period of minutes, hours, or days uh, in the same patient to guide management. And again, this points out the difference between a focused echocardiographic exam or the basic perioperative 
uh, TEE, uh, of which we have guidelines uh, already published on, uh, in this setting we're using quantitative parameters, or at least semi-quantitative parameters, uh, to guide therapeutic in- interventions and assess the effectiveness of therapeutic interventions. Uh, this is the area that's uh, developing in ECHO and really requires that we um, uh, have uh, literature there to support it, uh, and we're hopeful that uh, this document will uh, begin that process. The advantages of using ECHO as a quantitative therapeutic monitoring tool uh, you're all aware of the things that we use routinely in the setting. We, we have the right heart catheterization that's sometimes used at the bedside, uh, uh, oxygen saturation monitoring, uh, uh, and all the other type of monitoring tools that we do um, for assessing a, a patient's response to therapy. ECHO has the potential to supplement or improve uh, these uh, therapeutic monitoring tools by giving us Uh, measurements of filling pressures uh, of the right atrium and left atrial pressure, of cardiac output um, at the bedside or stroke volume. Uh, Obviously, it can also quickly give us an assessment of of any changes in valvular regurgitation that may occur. Systolic and diastolic function can be assessed and reassessed uh, in response to any kind of therapeutic intervention. In all these settings, uh, the real advantage of this is not only its portability, but also that it's a low-risk assessment and that we can rapidly do these tools, uh, these assessments, uh, and uh, at low risk to the patient. One of the disadvantages, of course, is how rapidly we can make uh, changes. Unlike the right heart catheter uh, or Swan-Gantz measurement where we can rapidly see a change in the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, or pulmonary artery pressures, uh, in this setting, uh, it takes uh, a little bit of effort um, and some time to make these changes. And and again, as we said, a a rigid adherence to quality is critical uh, if they're going to be useful. In the context of monitoring left atrial pressure, as you know, there's uh, a a series of parameters that we get from the transmitral um, assessments of peak E velocity, the the annular E wave velocity, E prime velocity, excuse me, um, that's obtained from, from the lateral and medial annulus. The E over A ratio, which is one of the um, uh, longest utilized of quantitative monitoring tools uh, that we have from this um, uh, in this area of monitoring effectiveness of therapies, the deceleration time also has been used in combination with that E over A ratio, as we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, qualitatively, it is critical. Uh, that we have proper Doppler alignment for these measurements, uh, and that we follow the uh, diastolic guidelines that recommend that we use uh, three consecutive measurements at end expiration in order to uh, accurately make these measurements. Uh, the left ventricular ejection fraction, um, as you know, uh, when it's normal, the guidelines have told us we can use the E over E prime as a, an index of left atrial pressure with less than eight being normal and greater than 12 indicating uh, an increased left atrial pressure. In the setting of abnormal left ventricular ejection fraction, um, the E over E prime uh, has not been uh, advocated as a uh, measure to follow or to at least measure left or uh, indirectly measure left atrial pressure. Here it's recommended we use the E over A ratio combined with the deceleration time uh, uh, with being an E over A ratio greater than 2 combined with a deceleration time less than 150 indicative of increased left atrial pressure, while an E over A less than 1 and E less than 50 centimeters per second, uh, indicative of normal left atrial pressures. And again, you can see uh, at this point, um, uh, we're talking about increased normal um, and not necessarily exact numbers um, uh, in the uh, setting of what we have available to us today. So that Doppler alignment is critical, whether it be transesophageal or a transthoracic echo, uh, here you see a transmitral uh, Doppler assessment uh, in the left panel, uh, and then the annular velocities where, again, the, the image is adjusted so that we can align ourselves well with the annular uh, measurements, both lateral and medial, you see uh, in the middle and right panels on your screen uh, in order to uh, uh, properly measure these. All of these are angle-dependent. Uh, and it's critical that we uh, op- optimize those angles uh, when we're making serial measurements, just as it is in that initial assessment. Uh, it's equally important in any subsequent uh, measurement uh, that these be followed, these rules be followed. 
from the standpoint of right atrial pressure, uh, I think most of us are familiar, again, with the right heart guidelines here. Uh, but again, one of the things we emphasize, uh, the writing group felt strongly that we emphasize, is that uh, when we make these uh, measurements of IVC collapsibility that is visualized adequately throughout the respiratory cycle, uh, and then the, follow the uh, rules, again, uh, giving us a range of right atrial pressures based on size, as you can see here, of the uh, inferior vena cava and the um, uh, degree of collapse that occurs throughout the respiratory cycle. Following those rules, um, uh, we have a very good way, we think, of assessing um, uh, the uh, different right atrial pressures uh, as long as the patient is not getting a, a positive pressure ventilation. Example that is shown here, uh, where uh, a patient that came in with a fairly large uh, pericardial effusion had measurements of the uh, inferior vena cava and the collapsibility index. Uh, uh, before and after, uh, 24 hours after pericardiocentesis. And you can see that prior to uh, pericardiocentesis, when we were monitoring this patient, the right atrial pressure was markedly elevated here um, and that it did not collapse throughout the respiratory cycle from 2.5 to 2.1 centimeters uh, and was obviously uh, dilated. Uh, within 24 hours, you can see the maximum size of the inferior vena cava had dropped uh, and there was uh, uh, more than 50% collapse throughout the respiratory cycle, indicative of now normal right atrial pressures. Again, this is very helpful in assessing uh, not only a response to a therapeutic intervention here, uh, but also on the opposite side, assessing when it becomes plethoric uh, in a patient you're monitoring with a pericardial effusion. The uh, 2015 uh, Chamber Dimension Guidelines, as you know, gave us um, uh, new measurements uh, that uh, help us in guiding at left ventricular chamber size at end diastole uh, for both men and women, as shown here, as well as volumes uh, using biplane uh, two-dimensional measurements. Note that we, uh, at this point, in terms of monitoring, uh, do not have any specific guidelines for uh, using strain or using three-dimensional measurements. Uh, as most of these measurements are, are made over a very short period of time uh, and the time required, at least for three-dimensional measurements uh, at this point, probably doesn't allow us uh, to make rapid bedside assessments uh, while the uh, chamber, the two-dimensional chamber dimensions, although subject to error in that they're linear measurements and, and not uh, three-dimensional measurements, um, still give us the more rapid assessment at the bedside and if done, uh, in a manner that, that allows for uh, quality and accurate assessment, uh, certainly will probably provide the quantitative uh, measures we need to make changes. Fractional error shortening uh, in the new guidance was still 35%. The RVS prime, as you know, uh, in the new guidance is, is this 9.5 centimeters per second as the cutoff there, uh, though in our guidelines we still listed greater than or equal to 10. I think uh, that's... Um, a minor uh, difference there, but I think we can still use that 10 and probably as our cutoff uh, uh, for assessing uh, changes in right ventricular systolic function. And the time velocity integral from the left ventricular outflow tract uh, should be greater than 18 centimeters uh, in a normal a patient, and, and our pulmonary systolic pressures combining our tricuspid recursion jet and inferior vena cava assessments should be less than 35. With that kind of uh, uh, assessment uh, of the potential parameters that we can use at the bedside before we go into the clinical scenarios, let's have a little question here uh, to make sure everybody's on the uh, same page. There are uh, specific monitoring parameters uh, useful in evaluating pericardial effusions include all of the following except A, effusion size, B, inferior vena cava collapsibility index. D, transmitral E over E prime increase to greater than 13, or D, right ventricular diastole collapse. We haven't quite talked about this specific parameter other than just the example I showed you, but let's just see where everybody is at right now uh, and how they would monitor a patient that comes in with uh, a pericardial fusion. Uh, which of these uh, four would you least likely uh, use? Again, like I said, all of these are useful parameters. Uh, but the um, one that, again, we're asking you they would least likely to use as a monitoring tool. Try to get everybody thinking monitoring here, not just that initial diagnostic assessment. 
Okay. Well, it looks like uh, uh, most of the crowd is correct. The transmitral E over E prime going to greater than 13 uh, is not in that list of parameters that we uh, routinely would use to monitor a pericardial fusion. The size, the collapsibility index, and right ventricular diastolic collapse would be uh, uh, parameters that we would be looking for. Uh, and uh, like I said, I see some questions coming up, and we'll get to those about uh, other uh, modifications uh, that we can use uh, in these uh, inferior vena cava parameters. But again, most of the audience seems to be uh, with us here on monitoring, uh, not just that initial diagnostic assessment. There's the answer uh, that we uh, would be most likely uh, not helpful in this particular circumstance. So getting to those clinical scenarios, uh, uh, as you know, we have uh, a wide variety of settings uh, that uh, people have used ECHO as a monitoring tool, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, left ventricular assist device assessments, uh, critical care patients, trauma patients, tamponade monitoring, just as we talked about on the previous uh, example, pulmonary embolism, uh, prosthetic valve thrombosis, uh, and then the perioperative setting, um, uh, that uh, involves transplantation, uh, major vascular, orthopedic and spinal surgery, uh, and neurosurgery. In the critical care setting, um, as you know, there's a wide variety of, uh, of uh, potential diagnoses uh, from uh, trying to evaluate hypotension, uh, unexplained hypotension to a patient that's in congestive heart failure or appears to be uh, sepsis, respiratory failure, uh, pulmonary embolus. All these um, countless times throughout the day, our critical care specialists have to uh, deal with these scenario, potential scenarios and trying to figure out uh, not only uh, what, which one uh, the patient classifies as having, but also how are our therapies uh, doing. And in that setting, uh, there is a reason to believe that the inferior vena cava collapsibility index, regional wall motion score index, uh, the cardiac uh, output or time velocity integral across the left ventricular alpha tract, and our assessments of left atrial pressure and right ventricular function all could play a potential role uh, in guiding uh, how well a patient is doing. Uh, we know that sepsis can cause regional wall motion abnormalities, uh, that with respiratory failure, uh, that uh, the, there are times where it's not able to, we're not able to use the IVC collapsibility index if they're on positive pressure ventilation. Uh, so it's using all these parameters together and knowing when um, one specific one is helpful uh, that uh, we can uh, appropriately manage the patient. Again, in that setting of critical care, um, one of the tables we have in the document, uh, Table 2, uh, goes through um, uh, what level of data support is actually out there to support um, these documents. And this is derived from the... Uh, anesthesiology document in 2010, uh, and you recall that A is when there's multiple randomized uh, multi-center studies to support uh, the use of any of these monitoring tools, and we don't have that yet uh, for any of these monitoring tools. Most of the, uh, the studies that have been done are in the category B, which is, you know, our observational studies uh, that permit uh, inference of benefit uh, of a particular guiding tool. Uh, some of them being um, uh, based on uh, case reports only, uh, in some cases, uh, or series of patients that were followed. So we really, in this area, still suffer from uh, not having those multi-center trials uh, that are necessary, critical care setting being one where we really need um, uh, uh, input there to determine how effective an echo-guided strategy would be. In congestive heart failure therapy, uh, there have been published studies uh, actually out for several years now that have used a specific uh, Doppler parameters uh, to uh, not only assess whether a patient would tolerate therapy, um, this is some work from Kapamala uh, back in 2001 that just used the E over A ratio and E deceleration uh, time uh, to initially risk stratify patients. Uh, and if they had an E over A greater than 1 and an E deceleration less than, uh, than 130 milliseconds, uh, they were given nitrile preside when they presented. And if that uh, reversed, uh, the E over A went back to less than 1, uh, they were considered responders, uh, and those patients actually did better uh, in response to carvedilol therapy and uh, had less events. Similarly, uh, 
uh, if patients presented initially with an E over A less than 1, uh, they weren't given nitroprusside. They were given uh, a leg raises, and uh, if, their, if their E over A had remained less than 1, they also responded very well to carvedilol uh, and had less events at follow-up. Uh, but if their E over A went to greater than 1 with passive leg raises, uh, the so-called unstable uh, non-restrictive pattern, uh, then they uh, were less effectively responsive to carvedilol and had more events. Uh, and this is an ideal situation where you can see uh, that uh, ECHO was used uh, to monitor, not only assess uh, whether a patient would respond to therapy, but also predict their outcome. It is important to note, uh, and the committee felt uh, uh, strongly about this, though there was obviously a lot of discussion in this area, that in patients presenting with heart failure, uh, three to four, uh, class three to four heart failure, uh, and depressed left ventricular ejection fraction, uh, that uh, there's controversy about whether the E over E prime uh, is, one, able to uh, measure or assess or uh, estimate the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure uh, and whether it can track um, uh, pressure changes in response to therapy. So at this time, uh, the committee did not feel that they could make that recommendation. As you remember, the diastolic function guidelines uh, tell us uh, to more closely monitor E over A ratios uh, in, and the E deceleration time in this particular uh, subset of patients with heart failure. Also, in the patients with left ventricular assist devices, uh, ECHO has been used as a therapeutic monitoring tool uh, to uh, not only uh, diagnose um, malfunction uh, in the left ventricular assist device, but also to guide uh, maybe optimal ramp uh, speed. Uh, this protocol uh, was uh, published by Uriel uh, in Journal of American College of Cardiology in 2012, uh, where they followed a series of parameters, uh, namely the left ventricular end diastolic and end systolic dimensions from the peristernal long axis, aortic valve opening and degree of regurgitation, mitral regurgitation, pulmonary artery, systolic pressure, and the inferior vena cavae collapsibility index as they um, ramped the uh, speed from 8,000 RPMs up to 12,000 RPMs. Uh, this was done uh, in patients that had suspected um, uh, complications of the uh, LVAD, including thrombosis of the LVAD. Uh, these are the parameters here that were monitored, again, assessing whether the aortic valve remained closed, uh, assessing whether the left ventricular dimensions fell at a specific rate uh, as the ramp speed was increased, uh, and uh, the severity of mitral and aortic regurgitation and pulmonary artery systolic pressure, uh, did that decline um, or did that uh, remain unchanged in response to increasing ramp speeds? Uh, these are some nice examples uh, from that study. Uh, the um, rusty line here uh, indicates the left ventricular uh, end diastolic dimension in response to increasing ramp speed, uh, which is along the x-axis here. And you can see a normal response was the left ventricular end diastolic um, uh, dimension gradually decreased uh, as the ramp speed was increased uh, uh, along the x-axis, while a flat response, like shown here, um, was indicative of thrombosis or dysfunction in the uh, LVAD inflow cannula, uh, and this was very helpful in discriminating uh, what, uh, uh, whether a, thrombos a thrombosis was present in uh, the uh, assist device. Again, using ECHO here as a therapeutic uh, monitoring tool, uh, monitoring tool uh, and uh, detection tool in this particular uh, circumstance uh, for inflow uh, cannula malfunction. Another interesting area, uh, again, uh, in a case series of 47 patients, was using the um, uh, changes in left ventricular internal dimension um, uh, uh, in a patient that had responded uh, after being on uh, LVAD for a period of time and their left ventricular dimensions had come down to less than 60 millimeters at end diastole. Uh, an off-pump trial uh, uh, was attempted. Uh, and monitoring of left ventricular ejection fraction and left ventricular internal dimensions at end diastole was done uh, after the pump was turned off. Uh, and if their ejection fraction uh, remained greater than 45% and the internal dimension at end diastole remained less than 55 millimeters, uh, those patients, uh, after the um, LVAD was removed, uh, had no evidence of heart failure reoccurrence. Conversely, uh, 
although the LVAD was removed in some of these patients uh, that did not meet these parameters, if it was, uh, they had a much higher uh, frequency of heart failure reoccurrence. Again, using uh, these parameters, uh, these two-dimensional parameters uh, here to actually assess whether uh, LVAD removal would be successful. We've already talked a little bit about pericardial effusion monitoring uh, and in that we can use this in a patient that presents uh, with pericardial effusion. We just had, again, a patient here just the last week where uh, there was a question of whether the patient had uh, pericardial tamponade, but there was still uh, IVC uh, collapse uh, going on. Uh, the left ventricular internal dementia endoscopy was less than four centimeters uh, in a female patient, and therefore volume was aggressively uh, administered to the patient, um, and they responded very favorably uh, to just uh, volume status as we monitor the left ventricular intervention and diastole and the inferior vena cava uh, collapsibility index uh, in response to aggressive fluid therapy. Uh, and it helped uh, considerably in not doing a pericardial synthesis in this particular patient in that they responded as we predicted they would uh, based on their IVC collapsibility uh, and uh, their left ventricular dimension in diastole. In prosthetic valve uh, cases where there's a suspicion of uh, thrombosis, uh, the uh, guidelines that have been published in the 2012 CHEST uh, recommend that we use echocardiography to guide um, uh, management should we detect a valve thrombosis, uh, mean transvalvular gradient, uh, as well as left ventricular and right ventricular regional wall motion are very helpful uh, in this setting in terms of assessing whether there is a dysfunction and the consequences of dysfunction. Uh, this is a 42-year-old patient um, uh, uh, that uh, had a 25-millimeter mechanical mitral valve uh, prosthesis put in uh, approximately three months prior to presentation, uh, came in with some worsening shortness of breath. Uh, INRs were uh, uh, subtherapeutic at, at some time points, but uh, other times it was actually, at other time points they were supertherapeutic, but there were clearly some time points there where there was um, uh, subtherapeutic INRs. Uh, and the initial uh, echo is shown here, uh, where you can see, even though she had very poor apical windows, uh, it's pretty obvious that the right ventricle uh, is dilated, as is the right atrium, uh, and the mean gradient across the mitral valve uh, prosthesis, which assessed immediately after surgery, was 3 to 4 millimeters of mercury. Here, had gone up to 12 to 13 at rest at a heart rate of 80 beats per minute. So there was a suspicion of valve thrombosis, which was confirmed by transesophageal echo, uh, which demonstrated a um, about a 0.7 centimeter uh, squared size thrombus uh, adhered uh, to the leaflets of the mechanical prosthesis. Uh, it was decided to give the patient um, uh, uh, fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, and within the next uh, 12 hours after the thrombolytic therapy, ECHO was, uh, again, a, a, a re used to reassess uh, therapy through a therapeutic responsiveness uh, to the TPA. Uh, and you can see here a marked reduction in the right ventricular size at end diastole. Uh, after TPA and a reduction in right atrial size that was accompanied, as you can see here, by a marked reduction in the mean gradient across uh, the mitral valve prosthesis uh, within just 12 hours of therapy here, the mean gradient was back down to 7 millimeters uh, of mercury uh, from uh, 14 to 15 here just prior to TPA. So you see here, again, using the right ventricular until dimension at end diastole, uh, the, and the mean trans uh, mitral gradient, uh, we could rapidly assess the response uh, to TPA. Uh, and the 2012 ninth edition of the American College of Chest Physicians uh, evidence based clinical back practice guidelines, again, uh, for patients with left sided pro uh, prosthetic valve thrombosis and thrombus area less than 0.8 centimeters squared, again, determined by transesophageal echo, uh, they recommend the fibrinolytic therapy. Uh, but that uh, we use a serial Doppler echocardiography uh, to uh, document uh, thrombus resolution. So, again, you can see the potential here uh, for uh, echo to be a very helpful tool in this particular setting. Again, a particular word of caution, uh, along all these steps, uh, we want to, uh, the writing committee emphasize that we uh, point out that uh, 
uh, quality and accurate um, uh, accuracy are critical uh, in doing these serial measurements. Uh, here's an example. Uh, this is taken just from the 2015 guidelines of how with the two-dimensional echo, you can, we can get various planes across uh, the right ventricle on a short axis plane, or these are actually the four chamber measurements, but these would be what they would look like across a short axis plane if you had um, uh, a something to guide you on, a, let's say, a biplane measurement of that. And you can see that we really need to try to obtain position one, uh, which is that longest, uh, largest dimension of the RV when we're going to use it for serial function. Uh, you can see that if we just did one the first time and two the second time, well, we'd see a reduction in size uh, that would uh, be misleading. Uh, again, it's critical that we try to obtain that same plane every time uh, when using serial dimensions in right ventricular size or left ventricular size um, when, uh, in uh, assessing the effectiveness of a therapeutic uh, intervention. In the setting of pulmonary embolus, uh, uh, often, as you know, there's the question of the role of TE in the initial, or transthoracic echo, excuse me, in the initial assessment uh, of a patient with pulmonary embolus. Uh, but often, uh, if the patient is hemodynamically compromised, echo becomes a critical tool, uh, not only in uh, helping uh, decide whether one wants to proceed with uh, TPA or a thrombectomy, uh, but in this particular case, uh, it can help us if we accurately measure right ventricular fraction or shortening. Uh, assess responsiveness to therapy. Uh, here's an example uh, of a patient that uh, presented with a worsening shortness of breath uh, and uh, mild decreases in blood pressure, uh, uh, but then uh, their systolic pressure, pressure dropped into the 80s. The right ventricular fractional shortening was measured at the time of echo after a CT demonstrated a large pulmonary embolus uh, that they had fractional area shortening of 13%. Uh, and a right ventricular dimension at N diastole of 4.6 centimeters. Again, a, 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 trans, a tissue plasminogen activator was given, uh, and within 24 hours, a fractional air shortening change of up to 53% uh, had occurred, uh, and again, documenting the efficacy of TPA um, in improving right ventricular uh, function in this acute setting. In the setting of trauma, uh, one would think that this would be a, a very exciting area uh, for uh, use of ECHO as a therapeutic monitoring tool. Uh, as you know, a wide variety of blunt trauma uh, and uh, sharp trauma can occur, uh, and uh, assessing uh, adequacy of fluid status uh, in an acute setting is critical using both the IVC collapsibility index, looking at pericardial fusion size, uh, as well as left ventricular size and systolic function uh, are critical uh, in addition to left atrial pressure monitoring as fluids are being administered in this acute setting. Unfortunately, though, uh, similar to the critical care setting, uh, there is not a validated study or a, a, even a case series which have really looked at the value of echo. And this is, again, just like in critical care, a very important uh, in terms of what the uh, committee felt uh, as an area that really needs to be investigated because the potential here um, uh, could be great. Um, uh, Dr. Samaj, uh, one of our critical care uh, specialists here, and uh, Dr. Barnett uh, gave, me, gave me this example just of someone they recently used the uh, portable echo um, on a patient that unfortunately um, got involved uh, with a, an altercation um, uh, with uh, a, another male over a female uh, and ended up getting a stab wound. Um, and as you can see, uh, the initial echo right when they hit the emergency room, uh, though uh, I believe the pressure was a slight little, about 90 systolic, uh, was obtained here. And then just literally a couple minutes later, um, uh, they reassessed. Uh, and you can see a marked increase in this effusion size just over a period of a couple minutes. Uh, this turned out to be a right ventricular apex stab wound uh, that was repaired uh, in the operating room. Again, uh, in these patients that are uh, undergoing both sharp or blunt trauma, uh, we can use uh, echo potentially as a very rapid quantitative monitoring tool uh, to uh, detect these uh, uh, acute abnormalities as well as monitor uh, patients uh, for any changes in right or left atrial pressure. Uh, the guidelines that I t uh, spoke with you uh, uh, that Dr. Theis was chairman uh, uh, for in terms of perioperative monitoring uh, 
emphasize that transesophageal echo should be used uh, for non-cardiac surgical patients uh, when the patient has known or suspected cardiovascular pathology that might result in hemodynamic pulmonary or neurologic compromise. And often, as you know, transesophageal echo is used in a rescue setting in this um, uh, circumstance or there be problems that occur. Uh, but more and more, uh, uh, we're uh, learning from our anesthesiology colleagues especially uh, that there is value in using quantitative monitoring tools uh, in specific high-risk situations that may uh, prevent problems down the road. Um, uh, and in that context, uh, we have several parameters that we could potentially use uh, and are being used um, quite frequently now, LV regional wall motion and volumes, uh, dimensions, uh, the parameters that we talked about measuring right ventricular function, again, a key parameter uh, not only in assessing patient risk initially but uh, to monitor patients, um, and just cavity monitoring in general where there's a potential for embolization uh, and, again, assessing left atrial pressures. Most of these patients uh, still have normal systolic function, and so the E over E prime is used. Uh, but again, the E over A ratio is used um, to monitor these patients. These are a couple of examples. Again, thank uh, Dr. Shilkut and Dr. Brackey, uh, anesthesiologists at our institution. As you know, Dr. Shilkut uh, contributed significantly to this part of the, the document, uh, along with our other anesthesiology colleagues in the group. Uh, this is a patient undergoing liver transplantation, uh, and where, again, uh, the trans um, esophageal measurements of uh, uh, E, transmedial E, and annular E prime measurements are being obtained early on in the study. Uh, so, the baseline assessment of both E to A ratio and E over E prime are uh, obtained. Uh, in this particular case, after cross cramp removal of the inferior venous cava after the transplantation, uh, you can see there was a marked change in this E over A ratio here, an increase in the E an increase in the E over E prime in a patient with normal systolic function, uh, and this resulted in immediate uh, cessation of fluid, uh, a reduction in fluid resuscitation that was occurring at this time, uh, and uh, intervened perhaps at a time where uh, we could prevent some of the post-operative atrial fibrillation and heart failure uh, that we hope to see uh, the show cut is part of an NIH grant that is actually looking at this uh, uh, using ECHO as a uh, therapeutic monitoring tool in the operating room to hopefully uh, guide fluid management and prevent some of the post-operative atrial fibrillation and heart failure issues as well as morbidity and mortality, other morbidity and mortality uh, problems that occur uh, in this high-risk uh, patient group. Um, and not only just liver transplant, but major vascular surgery uh, and even in potentially some patients with kidney transplantation. Here's another example. Uh, again, I thank both uh, Dr. Shokat and Bracky for this um, example of, uh, of the changes that occur uh, in this E over A ratio during um, uh, different periods in the operating room uh, and how it affects uh, and guides our management, uh, namely fluid management and vasopressor management. Um, uh, shortly uh, after the IVC cramp was put on in this liver transplant patient, you see a reduction in the E over A ratio, which was initially 1.2 uh, uh, prior to um, the, any surgery beginning just in the early operative setting. Uh, then during IVC uh, clamping, you see a reduction in the E over A ratio. And then this rather dramatic change that occurred um, after the inferior vena camp was, uh, cramp was removed uh, look at here, the E over A ratio goes up to 3.3. Uh, you can barely see the A wave, but a marked increase in the uh, E wave here. Um, and again, note in all these situations, again, making sure they were aligned uh, uh, very closely with the uh, mitral valve so that these measurements were uh, accurately obtained. Uh, and in this case, again, uh, you can see they promptly uh, uh, stopped fluids in the setting uh, and uh, it hopefully prevented some complications. Unfortunately, again, this, as we said, in the critical care setting uh, and trauma setting, uh, we have very limited data here. Uh, the guide, the, the uh, committee can find really only case reports in the setting of renal transplant where a plantation where um, ECHO was useful as a monitoring tool. In the setting of lung transplantation, there have been case series looking at right ventricular uh, fractional shortening, uh, S prime and the um, TAPSI, 
uh, measurement to guide inhaled pulmonary vasodilators um, in this setting uh, and uh, the monitoring of pulmonary vein anastomoses. Again, uh, this is, uh, again, case series, but uh, it does demonstrate a usefulness uh, of uh, the, these parameters in potentially guiding uh, uh, therapeutic interventions during the procedure. In major vascular surgery, uh, you can imagine during a or cross clamp, it would be extremely helpful in high-risk patients to uh, manage or look at renal regional wall motion and, and guide management based on regional wall motion. Uh, and again, look at the E over A and E over E prime um, uh, changes that may occur before and after aortic cross clamp to guide management. Uh, but a limited amount of data also exists in that area. Uh, and I did tell you about the, the ongoing NIH study that is looking at that here, uh, headed by Dr. Shilkut. The setting of orthopedic surgery, again, transesophageal echo is only considered a, a rescue procedure uh, in this setting. Uh, but uh, there is potential for monitoring uh, for fat emboli and right ventricular function, uh, just as it is in neurosurgery, uh, although only a small number of parent, uh, cases apparently are done in the sitting position. Uh, it has been uh, demonstrated to be helpful in guiding right atrial aspiration catheters, uh, and placement, uh, and detecting air entrapment and monitoring right ventricular system function in these particular cases. Let's go back to a review question here. Um, uh, as left ventricular assist rotation speed is increased in a patient with a left ventricular assist device uh, for refractory heart failure uh, in a RAMP study, all of the following statements would be true except left ventricular internal dimension diameter should decrease as speed is increased to 1,200. Aortic valve would remain closed uh, as, uh, again, as the uh, device is, the ramp speed is increased to 1,200. A rapid decrease in left ventricular internal dimension uh, would be uh, expected to occur uh, in, the, in the setting of device thrombosis. Uh, and pulmonary artery system pressure uh, should decrease as the ramp speed is increased. Which one of those is not true? Okay, very good. Um, the aortic valve uh, should remain closed, uh, and uh, there should be minimal aortic regurgitation as the ramp speed is increased, uh, as you become more dependent upon the uh, left ventricular assist device uh, for forward output. Um, and pulmonary artery system pressure should decrease, uh, corresponding, again, to uh, reductions in um, filling pressures. One thing that we said about the uh, thrombosis, uh, almost the majority got this correct, uh, if there is a uh, device thrombosis, there will not be any reduction in the left ventricular internal dimension at end diastole as that ramp speed is increased. So in this particular circumstance, the best answer was a rapid decrease in left ventricular internal dimension um, would indicate device thrombosis. That is not true. It should be a flat response, if you remember, uh, and not a decrease uh, in uh, dimensions as the ramp speed is increased. Now, one of the most important things uh, the committee had to put together was uh, when a meaningful change really had occurred. Uh, and um, for the most part, uh, at this point, uh, although, again, as I said, the emphasis is on the quality of the images obtained, we still are at a point where uh, our uh, changes are more uh, dis uh, discreet, uh, are less discreet and more categorical, I should say. Um, and that for IVC collapsibility, um, a meaningful change would be uh, if that uh, inferior vena cava had dilated and now there was uh, less than 50% collapse as opposed to more than 50% collapse. Uh, that's where most of the literature has been published on in terms of it's gone from a, a, a normal right atrial pressure to a high right atrial pressure. Uh, though theoretically, as you know, there's an in-between group there where uh, it's 2.1 uh, centimeters or bigger but still collapses as being a 5 to 10 millimeters, most of the literature is focused on whether it collapses um, uh, or doesn't collapse. So we really uh, have that as our best parameter for monitoring IBC collapsibility at present, though we expect more literature to probably be published that will help us determine how good are we at picking up uh, more subtle changes in right atrial pressure. E to A ratio, as we said, when the left ventricular ejection fraction is de decreased, Again, using one, less than one, one to two, and greater than two is probably helpful. Uh, 
uh, with the goal being that um, less than one would in, it'd be indicative of uh, normal left atrial pressures, one to two, uh, variable, probably, again, as we said, if, when it's greater than one with a short E deceleration time, uh, they may still have elevated left atrial pressures, and certainly if it's greater than two. E over E prime uh, in the setting of normal left ventricular ejection fraction, um, uh, this has been useful in discriminating between less than eight and nine to 14 and greater than 14 uh, based on various uh, um, parameter numbers. Uh, left ventricular alpha tract time velocity integral, a uh, 6% change would probably be indicative of a real change based on coefficients of variations that we could find uh, in just uh, serial measurements of this parameter. Uh, that something greater than 6% should occur before you uh, really have seen a, a meaningful change. Pulmonary systolic pressure, again, uh, going from less than 40, 40 to 60 and greater than 60, although there is a fairly small inter-observer variability, uh, most of the literature has used these as cutoffs for um, a mild, moderate, and severe pulmonary hypertension. Uh, any eight, greater than 8% change from where your baseline measurements would be reasonable uh, to suggest a change has actually occurred in left ventricular dimensions at end diastole or in systole. Uh, and again, that uh, is still could be also used as a discrete change, too, where it actually jumps above 4 centimeters. For example, in our patient that we talked about with the pericardial fusion, that may be when you're actually uh, returning volume status uh, closer to normal. 10% would be the cutoff for any significant change in fractional area change based on what we know about the, the coefficient of variation uh, of this parameter, uh, greater than 1.6 change in the S prime or 2 millimeter change um, uh, in the transannular uh, or the TAPC measurement uh, that's used from M mode. Finally, uh, we wanted to also emphasize, uh, and as uh, we have throughout the, the webinar, and in the paper, uh, and as I said, uh, the writing group felt that level two or level three training uh, was really necessary to really use ECHO as a therapeutic monitoring tool. Uh, this is because there's a certain amount of technical expertise um, that really needs to be, um, that can only really be obtained by doing 150 to 300 studies on your own uh, that helps you understand the importance of alignment uh, and especially with the Doppler measurements uh, and the, the two-dimensional left ventricular uh, and diastolic measurements uh, to ensure that you're really seeing a serial change uh, and that the quantitative measurements um, that we use uh, really require high-quality images. Uh, if the image quality is not uh, very good, it shouldn't be measured uh, and uh, therefore can't be used as a monitoring tool. Fortunately, uh, with most of transducers now, even in our obese patients, we seem to be getting uh, relatively good quality uh, Doppler measurements. But again, the expertise regard to, under, to, to, to identify that, unlike basic perioperative transesophageal echo or the focused exam, uh, which are other um, uh, guidelines and other um, required training requirements uh, are considered uh, uh, ample. Uh, here, it seems like uh, from the writing group that the consensus was uh, we need to have more uh, adequate tr uh, training, uh, at least performing 150 exams before you make some of these uh, measurements and use the uh, ECHO as a therapeutic uh, guiding tool. Clearly, uh, one of the biggest sections of the uh, area uh, of the whole writing committee's uh, uh, consensus was the need for large-scale clinical trials. <clears throat> They're lacking here. Um, it really is needed. You see the same kind of problem developing that occurred with pulmonary artery catheters in that they became standard of care before we really could document how uh, efficacious they were. I think we're at a, uh, a point in time where <clears throat> if we um, band together and p uh, perform some multi-center uh, investigations, uh, we can document um, uh, the, the benefits of quantitative monitoring, especially in these areas of critical care, uh, and trauma and uh, perioperative monitoring that are, uh, will help us down the road um, uh, as we uh, want to use these tools and uh, train others in these tools. Basic clinical trials are lacking, even in their trauma, critical care, and surgical applications. Uh, that would be uh, very helpful, uh, as we said, um, I even if single center at this point, uh, that would lead to multi-center uh, trials. There are many new areas of monitoring. Um, I'm just listing a couple here. Uh, 
where ECHO could have a major role, uh, perhaps in non um, uh, VTVF CPR guidance and that early emergency department resuscitation uh, scenario. Uh, this may be a very helpful area using ECHO as a continuous monitoring tool uh, that may uh, improve outcome in this particular form uh, of CPR. Uh, and as I mentioned, Dr. Shilkut's uh, uh, area, there, uh, I think there's other people working on this right now, um, but using uh, perioperative um, echo monitoring uh, to guide fluid management uh, and pressure management uh, in uh, patients with uh, significant cardiac history undergoing non-cardiac surgery to reduce complications and uh, improve morbidity and mortality in that post-operative setting uh, would be a major uh, advance uh, that would uh, potentially reduce a lot of the complications we see in these patients after surgery. And with that in mind, uh, I'm going to shift over to answering some questions and what time we have left. I saw a few of them there. I'm going to go through these, and not in any particular order here, um, but feel free to ask any more questions. Um, first of all, let's say when measuring left ventricular internal dimension uh, in the linear fashion, do you move the, uh, below the septal bend? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the area that appears thicker in the proximal septum, do you routinely exclude it uh, when measuring in, uh, inferior, excuse me, uh, interventricular septal thickness? That's a very good question. I think uh, from the standpoint of using it as a monitoring tool, it's probably uh, important that you do the same thing uh, twice. Uh, a lot of these patients have this discrete upper septal thickening, uh, and uh, it's probably not a true measurement if you use that uh, for your internal dimension and diastole, but if you're going to use it as a monitoring tool, uh, I think it's more appropriate uh, if you're going to use the absolute cutoffs of like four centimeters, you should probably move beyond that discrete area uh, of upper septal thickening. Uh, Julie Dunn asks, that in pure vena cava collapse, do you use as a SNF test or just watch normal, respir re normal respirations? End mode with SNF can actually have cursor move off the IVC, and that's a very good point. I think when you're using it as a monitoring tool, um, although the sniff is maybe helpful for an initial assessment, uh, I think spontaneous respirations are the best. Um, again, to emphasize that if the patient is on positive pressure ventilation, then it becomes uh, much more you know, not, uh, not as useful as a test. So if your first measurement, like we had a case last week where the first measurement of the IBC collapsibility was before they were intubated and put on positive pressure ventilation, then uh, fluids were started on the basis of that, well, um, after they were put on positive pressure ventilation, we really couldn't use that parameter anymore. Uh, but I think spontaneous respirations are best when you're using it as a, a monitoring tool. Uh, uh, Joseph Thompson, uh, what about atrial fibrillation patients? Um, yes, we see a lot of those. So are you talking, if you're talking about the, uh, the transmitral filling parameters, I presume, where we don't have that atrial contraction, the diastolic function guidelines uh, do... Um, have some, uh, 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 there is a section in the diastolic function guidelines that uh, talk about assessing this in atrial fibrillation patients uh, and monitoring um, both left atrial pressure and um, uh, diastolic function. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go into that, but I do refer you to that document. Um, it's not as uh, well worked out. You're exactly right. Uh, but certainly the E and the E deceleration, the height of the E or the actual E velocity and the E deceleration time uh, may be useful parameters in a monitoring setting, but obviously we don't have any data on monitoring patients in atrial fibrillation. Uh, given serial studies are performed over a relatively short period of time, is there a specific way in order to stay uh, within the uh, AUC? Um, I think, um, I'm trying to figure out what you're specifically asking. Charles, can you give me a little more detail what you mean by that the area under the curve? I don't, I don't understand that question quite yet. Maybe clarify that if you're still online. I'm going to the next one. Uh, when is TAPSI not helpful? Um, um, can we use TAPSI in all clinical scenarios? I, I would be uh, somewhat cautious with TAPSI. To me, this is an M-mode measurement where uh, any kind of change in angle uh, can be difficult. I know that uh, Nick Mark and one of our... Um, um, uh, anesthesiologist here attending anesthesiologist is working on some studies looking at um, the usefulness of TAPSI uh, as a not only uh, just it's used the detection and usefulness in transesophageal echo, uh, but also what it could be useful as a monitoring tool. But it is 
technically more demanding, in my opinion, to get that as opposed to the S prime. Uh, either one, though, I think could be uh, useful if you're able to you know, maintain uh, the same uh, angles that you did before and after any therapeutic intervention. Uh, okay, <laughs> this is a very good question. How sure can you be to assess an LVF greater than 45%? Uh, in an LVAD patient. Well, as you know, the apical windows are, although we recommend trying to get biplane measurements, we certainly use a lot of contrast uh, in our L left ventricular assist device uh, patients. Uh, Joan Olson, who uh, sits on the committee, has uh, really worked hard to try to uh, look at the uh, number of times we look at use contrast. It has helped us uh, quite a lot in making that uh, ejection fraction measurement. Uh, but acknowledge that's a, a very hard measurement uh, in a majority of these patients so with assist devices. I think it's probably more important to rely on the left ventricular dimensions of endiastole and insistently. Uh, what is the sensitivity of, of the um, IVC collapsibility in pericardial tamponade patients um, in patients with dehydration or when the E-wave velocity is less uh, than a 60? Well, I think if you have that kind of a uh, patient uh, where um, they're dehydrated, almost always you're going to have to uh, fluid resuscitate those patients. Um, I think that the IVC collapsibility is very helpful in that setting. Uh, uh, we use it quite frequently to uh, guide us whether uh, any kind of pericardiocentesis is necessary. Um, and uh, so I think that if you're getting those parameters and an E-wave less than 60, I see no reason why those don't uh, apply just as they would in a patient without a pericardial fusion and telling you that uh, you need to increase pressures, um, i.e. with volume, uh, to uh, before you make any decisions on a pericardial synthesis. What is the rule of, role, I presume, of stress echocardiography in monitoring patients with pulmonary hypertension? It includes any stress echocardiography as a monitoring tool in this current document, uh, but again, it, it, in a patient that uh, you're assessing efficacy of therapy, especially within the rules that we were using for ECHO as a monitoring tool, like within uh, minutes uh, to hours to days, um, certainly in a setting where you're monitoring uh, perhaps the uh, efficacy of pulmonary vasodilator therapies with endothelin antagonists uh, or uh, other vasodilators, uh, it has been helpful. But in this specific area of the, where we define ECHO as a monitoring tool, uh, we didn't uh, use, uh, look into that. Uh, what is the inter and intra-observer variability in E over E prime in the OR with TEE? Good question, Brad. I think that we do have some literature outside the OR that we put in the paper uh, in terms of uh, when we thought a meaningful change had occurred. Um, I think that's in Table 5. Um, there's an 8% coefficient of variability in um, E over E prime. Uh, the E over A ratio, about a 6% coefficient of variation, and we referenced that. Um, and uh, that did include some uh, perioperative assessments, I believe, as well in the papers we looked at that on. What is the e hemodynamic mechanism uh, or hemodynamic explanation for E over A decrease uh, after IVC clamping? Um, well, I think this would be um, equivalent um, to a preload reduction remover, if you will, to see if there uh, would be a, a change in EVA over A ratio in any a patient. Um, that responsiveness probably is a good sign, uh, similar to what we saw in patients uh, that received uh, nitro uh in the study that was done in 2003 uh, in heart failure patients, and that uh, there's that responsiveness of the E over A probably indicates that their uh, filling pressures and diastolic function is not so severe um, and a better prognosis. When you're talking about IVC collapsibility, are you assuming regular respiration? Okay, I think we answered that one. Yeah, it's uh, not. It's regular respiration. Spontaneous respiration is what we're uh, using for most of this. Um, tap seat greater than 2 millimeters, uh, 0 centimeters. Don't quite understand that one, Patricia. Could you run that one by me again? Um, please reach out to me re in regards to clinical trial assistance. <laughs> we will, uh, Dr. D. DeAngelis. Uh, our company has expertise with ECHO and ECHO quantifying monitoring quality and database expertise. Well, uh, Dr. DeAngelis uh, wants to work with us on clinical trial assistance. So all of you out there that are uh, help are going to um, start some trials, 
and uh, improve this document for the next time we write it, please contact Dr. DeAngelis. Echo while doing CPR doesn't seem possible. Oh, it's definitely possible. Um, there's published studies on that. Um, and I think, obviously, it's not really necessary in the setting of um, uh, VTVF, where we have established algorithms, but I think a non-VTVF, which has become an increasingly recognized entity, um, uh, both transesophageal echo monitoring has been performed um, and sub monitoring has been performed um, to assess the adequacy of compressions um, uh, and, of course, look for any interventions uh, or that are any... Uh, um, a tamponade or uh, other uh, small volumes that may be present that would uh, guide therapy in a patient with pulse electrical activity or asystole. Uh, it's possible. Um, uh, just go look at some of these uh, people. Are, it's amazing. Uh, I've looked at a couple of trials that have been done, and I think there's a real potential there. How about SVC collapsibility on TE to assess fluid status of ventilated patients? Um, I think that's the uh, it still would be a problem with any kind of positive pressure ventilation issue, but SVC collapsibility in a non-ventilated patient still is useful, too. It's just harder to find, but in TEE, it may be uh, uh, useful. Uh, okay, well, um, again, I thank everyone for these great questions, um, and uh, I think uh, there are many more here to, to an ad answer. I, I will... If you wish, uh, you can email me, uh, and if you have any burning questions, uh, and I'll get right back with you. Thank you very much for your attention.